Drinking water, and we want to make sure that nothing, absolutely nothing, impacts it. Tonight, our next stop on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, the Coldwater First Nation, where the pipeline has leaked before. And in 2014, we found out about the oil and gas project. More water concerns in Mi'kma'ki, where salt brine is a looming threat. But to come here and see see pictures like that quite haunting and mixed emotions about teaching Canada's residential schools history good evening I'm Beverly Andrews this week APTN is traveling along the route of the Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain pipeline to find out what people there think about the project today APTN's Tamara Pint Pimital visited the Coldwater First Nation located in the central interior of British Columbia. The pipeline runs through the community, but people there want nothing to do with the pipeline plan to triple the flow of the line. This land on the Coldwater Indian Band was once a playground for the children of Janice Antoine and her husband, Percy Joe. This is where they came with their grandmother to pick watercrest and to pick the wild mushrooms and, and the berries, as well as ride their horses down here and uh, hike through here. But like much of the reserve, yellow markers run through the couple's yard, indicating the existing Trans Mountain pipeline runs underneath. And it's made this land, which the couple has enjoyed for over 30 years, unusable. In 2014, there was a leak, or as Kinder Morgan called it, an anomaly. When uh, this leak occurred, of course, uh, the, our community became uh, more uh, concerned about what was happening with the pipeline and with other uh, easements through the land. Kinder Morgan cleaned the site, but the band feels the mitigation has only made things worse. Antoine says it's interfered with the natural flood irrigation and damaged their livelihood in agriculture. Until the spill, the couple rented this land out, so for them, it's a loss of income. I've always felt um, it was a treasure to have this land and be on this land. It is one of the areas where we have um, uncontaminated agricultural land that isn't covered with a lot of fertilizers or pesticides. We don't use pesticides. so. Uh, I don't, like I say, I still would like information on what the full impact has been. The existing pipeline runs directly through the center of the reserve and through Quinshotten Creek. The proposed Trans Mountain Pipeline route runs along the eastern border of the reserve along the Coquihalla Highway. That's right above Coldwater's aquifer, its main source of drinking water. The huge concern is the drinking water. And we want to make sure that nothing, absolutely nothing, impacts it. That's why Chief Lise Bahan says no amount of money will bring the band to sign a deal with Kinder Morgan. Whether it's in the reserve or out of the reserve, it'll still impact um, me and my membership. And but not only through our drinking water, but through our cultural and traditional ways. There are 350 band members that live on reserve, and the aquifer feeds over 90% of the community. Coldwater joined other nations and stakeholders last year in filing for a judicial review of the pipeline's approval. That is now in the hands of the Federal Court of Appeal. But for cold water, this isn't about politics. It's about ensuring something like this doesn't happen again. I'm very personally familiar that it does happen and, and I see how long it is to have things addressed. Uh, you know, going on four years and still not having use of, of this. Tamara Pimentel, AB10 National News, Coldwater First Nation. Members of the Mikasu Cree Nation in, are in Ottawa meeting with federal MPs about Bill C-69. That's a liberal law that is set to change environmental rules in Canada. Another pressing issue with the environment in northern Alberta, where the Mikasu Cree live, is Wood Buffalo National Park. It's a, 
UNESCO heritage site that United Nations says may lose its status. Melody Lapine is the Director of Government and Industry Relations for the Miccosukee Cree. She joins me in Ottawa. Welcome, Melody. Uh, what problems do you have with the government's proposed environmental legislation? Well, uh, today, uh, just actually a few minutes ago, I provided testimony to the Environmental Standing Committee on the, the proposed Bill C-69. And uh, some of the biggest concerns we raised today, uh, among many other Indigenous groups, is, is the basically the weakness and the uncertainty regarding the project list. So we are from the Athabasca oil sands region and the current draft of the bill really um, is indicating to us that there may never be a federal uh, impact assessment done within our region. And how will that affect the Wood Buffalo National Park which is uh, right in your backyard? So um, a world UNESCO site, Wood Buffalo National Park being Canada's largest national park, uh, is under threat from uh, numerous different uh, industrial activities, hydroelectric dams and oil sands development. And, uh, and this is as a result of the failures of uh, environmental impact as assessments done so far to date. They've never really properly assessed uh, how these proposed and existing projects uh, will have on impacting, uh, you know, the Peace Athabasca Delta and the World UNESCO site. So today we provided um, input to the committee to consider federal interests in, in the revisions of the bill to ensure that it allow uh, projects uh, such as smaller projects and uh, within the oil sands and that they are included and that th there can be these uh, triggers for the you know the proposed environmental impact assessments we would like to see um, federal environmental impact assessments within the region so that th they can assess impacts on the wood buffalo national park on the delta on you know threatened species like woodland caribou and bison uh, migratory birds and navigable navigable waters so uh, those are some of the things that we would like to see in the in the in the proposed bill and so you were attending the committee hearing. Did you get a sense that something is going to change? It's really hard to, to, to say at this point. I know the, there are very aggressive timelines in trying to pass this bill, and, and uh, you know, they're hearing from different uh, members of the from the public, but I think the whole reason why uh, the government is undertaking a review of the uh, CIA 2012 and proposing, you know, Bill C-69 is to restore public confidence. Uh, you know, we see some positive changes within the bill, like uh, they are now going to uh, assess impacts on culture and Section 35 rights. Uh, however, if it's not triggered and there actually are, are no assessments done to do assessments on impacts to rights, then really the, the draft bill um, is really useless to us. All right, well, that's great, Melody. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us about this. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. In Nova Scotia this week, elders and water protectors are walking for the water the Mi'kma in Mi'kma'ki and across Turtle Island and the globe. The annual ceremony began Sunday on World Water Day, just 24 hours after the Canada-Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board approved British Petroleum's application to drill for oil off the province's coast. The walk also happens amid Mi'kma'ki resistance to the Alton gas project, which would dump salt brine into the Siba Ganagadi River, an important waterway the Mi'kma'ki have used for thousands of years. For seven years we were walking to um, raise awareness about the, you know, the sacredness of water and how it's our responsibility as women to take care of the water. And in 2014, we found out about the Alton Gas Project. And then we started doing the water walks along the river. Um, this year, I felt really uh, compelled to, to uh, hold the walk a month earlier because of the imminent you know, uh, threat to our water from Alton Gas to at the brining site. And we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page, follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go to our website aptnnews.ca. According to a new report, the protection of wild salmon on the British Columbia coast is falling short.
Canada's environmental watchdog says the federal government isn't doing enough oversight in fisheries management. Here's Annette Francis with more details. Environment Commissioner Julie Gelfand held back no punches when it comes to gaps in the management of BC fish farms. We found that Fisheries and Oceans Canada had no national standard for nets and other equipment to prevent escapes from fish farms, nor did it adequately enforce compliance with aquaculture regulations. As well, the department has not set limits on the amount of drugs and pesticides that fish farms can use to treat diseases and parasites. Galfin's latest report found that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, along with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, did not adequately manage the risks associated with salmon aquaculture, consistent with its mandate to protect wild fish, and that the department and the agency had not clarified roles and responsibilities for managing emerging diseases. It recommends the department should more effectively enforce aquaculture regulations and pursue additional enforcement measures. Just last month, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans came under pressure to test for perceived real virus in BC fish farms that some believe is potentially deadly. The audit found that there is no clear sense of the health of wild fish. As a result, Galfin says the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is at risk of looking like it is prioritizing aquaculture over the protection of wild fish. There's no threshold for action when wild fish stocks decline. So nothing that says as soon as a wild fish stock declines to a certain point, we're going to take action. In a written a statement, Minister LeBlanc Act. of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans welcomed the Commissioner's recommendations and that his department will take appropriate actions to ensure they're addressed. And at Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. In Manitoba, the province's chief medical examiner has called an inquest into the police-involved shooting death of a 23-year-old Indigenous man last year. Adrian Laquette died last September from multiple gunshot wounds during an altercation with police, who were in the process of conducting an investigation at the time of the shooting. Police said they were responding to a series of incidents that were linked to the same suspect. A date for the inquest has not been set. Coming up after the break, a look at a new facility in BC that aims to teach as well as help heal the legacy of residential schools. But first, let's take a look at the weather outlook for tomorrow. Partly cloudy in St. John's and plus 13, some rain in Fredericton, plus 14. Flurries in Inukjuak and minus 2, cloudy in Cartwright and minus 7. Rain in St. Jovet and plus 9, cloudy and plus 8 in Septile. Toronto has rain and is at plus 13, North Bay is cloudy and plus 2. Sunny in Kappa's Casing and plus 6, Big Trout Lake is at plus 12 with some rain. Thompson is partly cloudy, plus 7, rain in Island Lake, plus 10. Dauphin has some cloud and plus 16, Brandon warm and sunny at plus 18. Partly cloudy in Yorkton and Swift Current, both at plus 13. Sun in northern Saskatchewan, Stony Rapids, plus 2, LaRange, plus 9. The Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Centre is now open to the public in Vancouver. As APTN's Tina House reports, old meets new as technology is making it easier to unlock one of Canada's saddest chapters. Located at the University of British Columbia's campus is the new Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Centre. The newly constructed building was opened as an affiliate to the TRC National Research Centre at the University of Manitoba. Link Kessler is the director of the First Nations House of Learning. He says the centre is a crucial aspect of healing for survivors and their families. We have many different ways of working with the information. Some are workstations that are single users. And of course we have a lot of this information is online where people can access it from their homes. This space we think is very important uh, partially because of these large displays which allow people to work with information in a very different way. 
this map of Canada is interactive, and the blue dots represent former residential schools. With the touch of the screen, anyone can open the documents associated with that school, including photos and records. For Squamish elder Sam George, he says he was a bit shocked to pull up his old residential school and immediately recognize himself, his brother, and his friends in the photo. A lot of these, a lot of these boys here are gone now. Out of uh, about 40 of us started in grade one, there's three of us left. He attended the St. Paul's Residential School in North Vancouver, B.C. in 1959. He says from day one, it was a traumatic experience for him, and it took many years to heal, but he will never forget. You know, there's a need for something like this. Um, it's, it's, it's our history, a big part of our history, a big part of uh, suffering and pain, but in its documented. You know, it wasn't just, it was a bad dream, you know, a night, long eight-year, nine-year nightmare for me in residential school. But, but to come here and see, see pictures like that, quite haunting. Doris Paul attended the Seashelt Residential School starting at the age of six. It's her first time here, and she says she needed to come here to help with her healing journey. Survivors can come in and can check in on their, their past and maybe hopefully, you know, move forward as, as they learn about their childhood trauma and uh, learn as adults that they can uh, heal. You know, they can heal that child that was damaged. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. An all-Indigenous health team celebrated a milestone today in the capital of the Northwest Territories, an on-the-land healing camp. Our reporter Charlotte Mort Jacobs has more on what residents of the North are calling a long time coming. Out from the city and into the bush, guests arrived to celebrate the opening of an on-the-land healing camp right in Yellowknife. It's been a long time coming. The Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation formed over a year ago with the vision of bringing a healing camp to help homeless and vulnerable Inuit, Métis and Dene people. Completely free space. This is the people's uh, healing camp, and you know they can always expect a uh, you know a warm face, a warm hug, a hot, hot cup of tea, and uh, support available when anybody needs it. Dr. Nicole Redverse is one of the founders. She says while the camp will eventually be moved closer to Yellowknife's new hospital, healing could start right away. Well, our elders, uh, you know, are not going to be here for another 30, 40 years, and it was really important for us to uh, not wait any longer. We've been waiting long enough, 30, 40 years, for something like this in the city of. Yellowknife. Clients will be able to drop by for everything from drum ceremonies to storytelling to counseling to sweats. For Edna Ellis, an Inuit rep on the board of directors, the opening today means new beginnings for many. And I believe it will work because, you know, you, no matter where you come from, you go out on the land, springtime, across the Arctic, people head out to camps, traditional camps. We've had lots of turmoil in the winter, sadness, sorrow, and just, you know, social ills. And you come out to a place like this, or any camp at all, you know, you leave that behind, you forget it. Spring is here, you know, spring rejuvenates and energizes people. The foundation is expecting the services to be used immediately as there is no addictions or mental health treatment center in the territory. A lot of our focus uh, so far in the programming has been on our downtown core, so a lot of the homeless population, people at risk. We've been doing lots of work with jails, uh, as well as some of the uh, high school students, uh, particularly those at risk. Um, and, you know, with the opening of this particular camp, it allows us to expand a little bit more of our populations for, for those uh, that need it. And even from my own region in the Qitaqmi, we have Inuit men and women that you know, really need this kind of help and uh, that the healing that needs to happen to help them get off the streets. The foundation was awarded a one million Arctic Inspiration Prize this January, but will seek territorial and federal funding to expand. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. After the break, we'll get into the ring with a boxer who is bringing the sport to youth in central Alberta. But let's take a look at the rest of the weather lookout for tomorrow.
sunny and high level and plus 14. Peace River, also sunny, plus 12. Red Deer has sun and plus 11. Calgary and Lethbridge, also plus 11, but cloudy. Su sunny in southern BC, Vancouver plus 16, plus 18 in Bella Coola. More sun in Fort St. John and plus 14. Cloud in Prince Rupert, plus 13. Clown cover and plus 10 in Dawson City, Mayo and Watson Lake. Norman Wells partly cloudy and plus 7. Yellowknife zero and sunny. Saks Harbor is cloudy and minus 8. Polituck is minus 2 with some flurries. Sunny and minus 15 in Repulse Bay and Chesterfield. Talioke and Iglulik, both sunny and minus 18. A boxing club in Samson Cree Nation, Alberta, is hoping to bring more youth into the sport. They feel it helps kids to grow and choose a healthy lifestyle. And to do so, they invited a well-known boxing instructor to show them the ropes. Chris Stewart brings us this story. It's an hour's drive. So if I show up, you guys got to show up. Right? Pascalano Santoro has been a boxer and has trained boxers for decades. Santoro, who is Métis and lives in Edmonton, brought his children to Samson Cree Nation's Howard Buffalo Memorial Center to introduce boxing to the youth here. His son, Rafael, is training for a pro fight April 28th. Today, they are volunteering their time to promote the benefits of boxing. Well, we're actually doing Raphael's workout routine for his pro fight, so we're going to go through the whole circuit because there's enough equipment here to do the circuit with them, and I think it'd be good for the kids to see that, you know, that the inspiration and the drive and the self-focus. Aaron Lightning says that boxing and MMA training and competition have helped him tremendously. It's keeping me out of trouble. I, I've been sober for over a year, no alcohol. Um, I actually work full time. Uh, my kids actually love what I do. I have medals from boxing and I just got jiu-jitsu medals because as I said, I'm doing MMA. This boxing club doesn't rely on funding, but they are hoping to get some funds from federal grants to bring in trainers like Centuro to help the youth of Muscatees to give them some confidence and fitness. Fighter Jesse Bull from nearby Louis Bull Tribe thinks having a qualified Blue Book trainer will be a huge benefit. It would be awesome to be able to have a real legitimate boxer who could, you know, give these youth some Blue Books give them a goal to shoot for, you know, because they can only get so far without the blue book, which uh, discourages them. So that blue book and that goal of getting to the amateurs, you know, will encourage them and give them confidence. Lightning says it's easy to get started. He says having the boxing club is essential to this community. It, it's actually really important because this will keep a lot of youth out of trouble. And it doesn't cost, cost much to train. You just show up, give it your hard-earned sweat and tears, it's like, just put in the work. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Samson Cree Nation, Alberta. And that is your APTN National Newscast for this Tuesday. Coming up next, a brand new episode of The Laughing Drum with Tim Fontaine. You won't want to miss all that fun. I'm Beverly Andrews. Have a great night. <laughs>